thank you all for coming to the Blender Education Community Meeting. We're just keeping the doors open because it's quite hot in here. So th there will be some disturbance maybe from people walking around as we're sitting next to the kitchen. But uh, I hope we can have a nice uh, meeting and um, it uh, cools off a bit in this room. So cool. We're going to talk about um, a bit of Blender education. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, as the talk already mentioned, this is a community meeting. So it's about you communicating and meeting. So just to see who's doing what with education, getting to know each other uh, before we dive into all kinds of subjects. Uh, I would do a round, would like to do a round. Um, introduce yourself. What are you doing with Blender? What are you teaching? And if you can show something, let me know, because usually after the introduction, there is room for people to show students' work. I know Tobias is uh, showing something, and maybe perhaps uh, the people from Ubisoft are going to join in a bit later to show something about the Blender Jam. So starting with me, uh, I'm Monique. Um, Yes, I'm teaching Blender at a uh, school and a high school uh, at the moment. So I'm just going to go around with a microphone. Um, hi, I'm Tobias. I'm, I'm teaching Blender in the uh, Blender Summer School in Germany. It's a German-speaking school, which I will talk about later. Hi, I'm Andre. I'm, I'm a teacher, but not uh, teaching Blender at the moment. <laughs> uh, Cedric, I'm uh, part of uh, Active Design, which is a school in, French, uh, in France dedicated to uh, free graphic software. So we teach Inkscape, Scrabble, Blender, Godot, and many other uh, software since 2005. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Hi, I'm Florent. Um, I'm teaching uh, Blender uh, and Unreal Engine to engineering school in France. Great. Yes, me too. And uh, I fight to uh, uh, to the school uh, leave three days max for Blender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alessandro. I teach Blender at different levels, from high school to Academy of Fine Arts in Bologna, to a workshop for professionals, so applying to 3D printing and uh, computational design stuff. Hi, my name is Peter. I work in Poland at the University of Gdańsk, and I'm teaching Blender possibly everywhere. Like a Blender evangelist, I deliver Blender to the university, and I'm teaching mainly graphics, animation, simulation. And this year, I proposed 17 new classes entirely based on Blender. Yeah. So I think it will be going next year. So in, that will be a huge thing, I think, if I succeed with that. Um, my name is Mary. I'm not teaching Blender at the moment from an Australian university, but I am trying to get them to, to take on Blender. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm, I'm from Brisbane in Australia. And yeah, I was at a university and I convinced them to go from Maya to Blender. And then now we've gone back to Maya. So I lost the battle temporarily, but, um, but now I'm teaching uh, some police to do forensic animation in Blender. And they're very interested in Blender. Hi, I'm Lech. I've started the Chocofor.com website where we focus on uh, te how to teaching how to use Blender in architectural visualization field. Hi, I'm Brandon. Uh, I'm with TheOrangeGuild.com, and we're working on building an online platform for Blender artists and trying to get certifications going for different artists using Blender. Hi, I'm Louis. Uh, I have started a YouTube channel back uh, two years ago, and it's been really good so far. I have been teaching Blender mainly for game development and VFX. Hi, uh, I'm Christoph. I'm teaching Blender for uh, 12 years, maybe longer. Um, I teach children from, well, 10 till they give up. 
Um, I make movies, I print, I do everything where is interest in, as long as there is brand involved, of course. Uh, I think I'm from very far away, I'm from China, <laughs> in Hong Kong. Yeah, so uh, we, s we have a magazine called the uh, Global Animation Magazine. Uh, you guys can get a copy of this. Uh, we try to get Blender into China to teach from high school, so I'm interested to people how you can get a program into high school and then to university and then to the studio as well. So our school start with, uh, we have a research center in the university, in Shenzhen University. So hopefully next year we can introduce Blender into China. And I'd like to talk to anybody who interested to uh, teach us how to start from, uh, to teach high school mm -hmm. students about Blender. <laughs> what we're gonna do is after the introduction, uh, a few people will show their work, I know Tobias, and then we can have a discussion on that and we can share thoughts on, the, on that topic. Uh, I'm Oliver Villar. I run or used to run uh, Blendus.com in English. Now I'm focusing on the Spanish community because there is a lack of educational uh, content there. Uh, so I'm running Blendus.s. I plan on coming back to English tutorials next year. So looking forward to that. It's one of the reasons I came this year here. And uh, I'm the author of the book Learning Blender. And uh, um, I teach at the university in Spain also, with Blender, everything with Blender. Hello, another Peter. Uh, I'm teaching in Japan just uh, the introduction uh, computer graphics lesson, and then also doing and touching a little bit of uh, virtual reality for the university, creating it in 3D, looking at it in, in the 3D uh, virtual reality viewer. Um, I'm Ruben. I started months ago teaching middle schoolers uh, Blender, uh, four games. Uh, now I'm I'm working in Brussels uh, as a teacher in a uh, professional training center for programmers, so so they can communicate with animators and artists. So I'm I'm teaching them like uh, that that bridge. <laughs> so yeah. I'm Eric, and I run a website called ArtisticRender.com, and I like I like. Uh, write long format articles because I found that there is so much video content and almost no one is writing about Blender, so that's kind of what I do. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Evgeny and I'm a, not really an educator, I'm a tech art lead at uh, Crazy Panda, game development company, but one of these days I hope to show the world uh, the wonders of the tech art field and Blender is a great tool to start because it has Python, it has, uh, it is open source so you can even extend it. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jeroen, I'm not really a teacher, I'm more a developer for Blender, uh, but I'm curious in uh, what's, uh, what's being said here. Hello, I'm Giulio, I'm not really a teacher and I'm working with Alessandro Zamparelli. Um, we are trying to create a um, specific training course for um, a prosthetic and orthotics modeled in Blender. And so now we're trying to develop this in order to um, 3D printing. So it's very specific, but something we're starting. Hi, I'm uh, Georg from Berlin. I'm a film and video director and general VFX artist. Um, I'm not teaching Blender yet, but I would like to in the future. Hello, I'm Gary uh, from Dublin in Ireland. Um, I don't work directly with Blender uh, professionally at the moment, but we have a partnership with um, a training, an on online training course platform called DataCamp. Um, and one of the languages they focus heavily on is Python. And I'd be interested in the idea of a, a module by them for uh, Python scripting in Blender. Um, I'm Kira. I'm from Dublin as well. I'm not teaching Blender at the moment, but something I'd be interested in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So um, there's a lot going on um, when it comes to teaching and Blender, and uh, we started this community meeting I think three, four years ago because uh, many people were asking, 
and basically many students were asking like, hey, what is Blender doing on, uh, with teaching? Because we want to learn about Blender, but there is not much material out there really focusing on students. So um, three years ago, we started B3D 101, which was um, really an uh, initiative from Peter Kemp, the people from the UK uh, running 3D AMI, and me, and I think people from the German Python community, Peter Koppatz was involved as well. And we said, okay, we just create a website because we were sending all these tutorials to schools and kids. You know what? We create a website, we put everything online, and schools can, um, you know, use the material and learn Blender. And it, it kind of got a bit out of hand because we indeed got a lot of uh, schools uh, using our tutorials. Um, these tutorials are set up in a in a way that it's really accessible for young students. So it's not doing like 10 shortcuts in one minute. It's really building up very slow. Um, the idea is that we focus on learning the basics and it's video and handwritten because we've seen that some students don't like looking, watching videos and can't learn from uh, watching videos. And we've recently uh, released 2.8 tutorials those are just the videos, but not the handwritten tutorials yet. And we try to translate them to multiple languages. So it, um, this was something we've set up three years ago, and suddenly we found ourselves, our, our, our material also on the Code Club platform of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So um, it's also really nice to see that um, many initiatives has, have adopted uh, the tutorials to teach young students about Blender. And um, I've already got a request from the Blender, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, like, hey, when are the 2.8 tutorials ready? And um, it kind of spread. So we've seen uh, a lot of schools now using tutorials, teaching Blender, not being afraid of teaching Blender, because that was uh, one thing we ran into, that a lot of teachers we're saying, hey, Blender is really too complicated and I don't have time to, to learn. I'm a teacher, I'm, I already have this pile of work, I'm not gonna spend time on it. So uh, we said, okay, you know, I know. So um, we created these tutorials, um, we kind of tested them with students and we kind of figured a way to teach these tutorials or to, to set up these tutorials so that kids can basically learn by themselves. And, um, and that's basically what's happening. If I'm looking at my school, uh, the students are basically learning by themselves and they don't need me anymore. So this year when 2.8 was released, I came in September and it was like, oh yes, Monique, look here, 2.8. I'm already creating these kind of cool things. I was like, cool guys, I haven't made the tutorials yet, but cool that you're already busy with it. So this platform was basically uh, set up for young students and I'm, I put the age 10 plus there, but we really got students from six years and eight years old. So I think that's a bit young, but they were already practicing. And um, this is really mainly focused on young students, absolute beginners and um, trying to learn them the basics um, and start to and start to have them create themselves. Uh, one type of feedback we got back from uh, a lot of students is yes, okay, there are a lot of tutorials out there. We can learn from YouTube, but at the end, um, if somebody would ask me how to create something, I have no clue where to start. So either I will copy what I've seen on YouTube, but I cannot think for myself. And this is like a feedback we get back many times from young students who try to learn from YouTube videos and somewhere get stuck because they cannot create uh, things by themselves. So um, yes, we have the 2.8 tutorials. It needs, uh, we need to work out the step-by-step -step description. I know we had the Code Club from Belgium emailing me two days ago like, hey, when are you gonna have those available? 
uh, it's coming. We're still working on it. Um, so uh, to make at least these tutorials available. They're free, um, they're online, and um, you can try them in your classes. Um, we do still, if we have the step-by-step -step descriptions, we are still looking for people to translate them to different languages so that we can reach out to multiple kids. Um, I know you said uh, you were talking about teaching in Spanish, and um, I know we've translated the 279 tutorials to Latin Spanish, and there was a huge interest. So I know there are, even in the people from South America were asking, um, can you please do Latin Spanish? With, because we do want to learn. Yeah, but we did. There was uh, Carlos, Carlos Santana, he's uh, from Venezuela, now in uh, Bolivia. He did the translation in Latin Spanish, and it was really, we have like um, 1,200 to 1,500 uh, unique users per month staying minimum time of seven minutes on our website. So people are really learning, trying to learn from this. Um, and getting the multilingual out there, is, it really helps uh, bridge the gap. So maybe we have Chinese uh, someday. That would be... <laughs> That would be great. Um, but again, they're free, they're out there, and um, teacher can use, teachers can use them to uh, create tutorials. Um, we have also 3D Ami. Uh, unfortunately, Peter and Tom uh, couldn't be here. We do usually the education meeting together with them. But um, they did, well, they asked me, okay, can you mention we did the 3D Ami Summer Studio? Um, it's, um, they do a seven days create your own movie with young students, uh, aged 14 to 18, and it's really great what they create um, every year. And they really run it like a studio. So they do st from storyboarding, and I think they got a bit to compositing this year, uh, but it's form teams and just get the studio-like experience. And uh, I think they're gonna publish the results soonish um, and it's really great to see what they are creating what their students are uh, creating so that's a bit what i know is uh, happening on b3d 3d yummy there is really much more going on i know tobias is doing the blender day and also the weekend school so he will be talking a bit about that and i know ubisoft has been doing the blender jam now they promised that they would come in the second part of this talk to show what they've been doing with the Blender Jam. But let's see how it goes, and then we'll go into a bit more discussion. Um, hi, um, my name is uh, Tobias. I'm the co-organizer of the German-based Blender 3D Summer School, and um, we were um, trying to find a way to teach Blender to everybody who is interested in Blender, so pupils, students, um, freelancers, uh, older persons. We have all of them, uh, the, the age range, uh, range is very uh, broad and um, I would like to show you some insights what we have learned about it. Um, we offer uh, 10 workshops each year. Each workshop lasts for three hours. So this is, this is a long workshop. Um, our uh, speakers need to prepare for this. You cannot from stand up, give a three hour workshop with, with a good concept. So we have to pay um, those speakers. They um, prepare everything in advance. Um, and we have um, a concept that has a specific topic in the center, a specific a story in the center. So we do not uh, teach some special technical uh, method but we, for example, for the um, EV workshop, we make up a story with it. So this is um, our finding that is very important to reach um, young people, to, uh, to, to give them some idea what you can do with it finally. And we will just tell a story, for example, like this, uh, where a rocket is flying through canyons and 
And during that, that story, there are so many technical stuff, of course, to explain. And this is what the workshop is about. So during the workshop, we explain how we could do such a movie. And um, what is also very important for learners, that they have some kind of structure. So here, Ablauf is the German, so this is the curriculum, the structure. And this structure um, clearly uh, says what we will do to each after another, so the people can prepare for it. And we also um, prepare a zip file where you can download all the assets. So we have a structure in, in courses. So the workshop is structured in courses. And for each course, you can download a blend file. And the advantage of this is that if someone gets lost, he or she can uh, follow very easily because she's just loading the blend file and then uh, a new lecture or a new lesson starts in the workshop and um, everybody is up to date. Um, we also publish all the assets that the speakers have created for free under a CC BY license so that everybody can use it and, and make whatever he or she wants to do with it. Um, besides the standard topics like modeling or shading or um, animation, we also have we also had two very important or very special um, workshops this year. One was the EV uh, topic and the second is a grease pencil animation because there was a lot of interest in those new um, functionalities of Blender 2.8. For our speakers, it was uh, a little bit yeah, overwhelming and, and sometimes a little bit too early because this um, summer school was uh, held in July this year, it was exactly two days before officially Blender 2.8 was released. So even before it was officially released, we had to prepare all the stuff and it was very clear that we wanted to make Blender 2.8 as a default version in our workshop. For the next year, we have something new and this is we invite our participants to vote for 20 workshops and the best 10 voted are then prepared. The reason is in the feedback sessions, always people complain about, oh, this topic is missing and I missed this and that. And now we hope that uh, the audience will vote um, their best, uh, their, their highest interest uh, topics so we can then provide those topics for our participants. After two days of workshop, we have a day of presentations. It's called the Blender Day. And this year we were very honored that uh, Andy Goralcik gave us an introduction how Spring was produced. I think he will um, reuse many of his slides tomorrow. He will have the, the starting talk tomorrow. And uh, in July he already gave the German community some insights. And this was also very great for our students and, and, and young uh, people because they knew that if they go to the Blender school, they also have contact and can speak to them to, to really uh, great artists. And so it was, uh, it was a success uh, in, in, in all areas, I think. After the, school, <coughs> after the school, we invited eight participants to make a movie together. So some of them never made any movie before, even not a shorter one but we just invited them, we paid them um, the accommodation and they had free lunch. And then we together learned how to make an animation movie. And um, Ruth, was a, Ruth Famino was a creative uh, director. She was also, she is still a pupil uh, from Germany. And we made this movie, it's a very short one, it's just one minute 50. And during the making of that movie, we learned a lot about how to work together in a team. And this was also very interesting for the participants. They did not only learn how to make stuff in an industrial-like pipeline, they also learned how to work together and how to specialize and, and what problems arise if you have a large team and distributed uh, teammates. And yeah, it was... It was very nice and I hope we can do this also in the next year because to make a real 
animation and to 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 finish it it's a it's a very great feeling for the participants okay i think that was my introduction thank you great nice to see uh, the progress of the because basically you're going to do this next year as well right yeah cool in, in july Um, just a question, is anybody thinking about doing a summer school? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm thinking about this as well, it's sponsoring. Okay. So I'm thinking about doing something like that, but I first have to find sponsors because the university is not going to help much with that, I think. Sure. So uh, sponsoring is, is a very difficult topic uh, especially or also in Germany um, I was looking for sponsors I was not that successful but fortunately um, the University of Applied Sciences offered the rooms for free in their computer uh, laboratories so this was uh, was a huge advantage and then we we um, had a, a fee that the participants had to pay it was 30 euros for students and, and pupils and 60 euros for free, free, freelancers who are not uh, students anymore. And um, that money was enough to pay the 10 uh, speakers that had to prepare so, uh, workshops. So, and, um, so roughly we had at the end a balance about zero euros, so it was uh, financially affordable for us. Nice. You wanna? You had a question? Yeah. So the idea is that I'm creating right now something like Blender Day. This is exactly the same name, and in one month from now it will be in Poland, in the end of November. This is fifth year of such kind of event, but it is con constant rate. The students great, so no financial support at all. And maybe I have to go business way. I don't know. Well, that's the good idea, I think. Cool. Uh, from my own experience um, in the Netherlands, we also try to create a blender day or something like that at schools. But we have the same challenge. Finding funding is, uh, is really hard. And, um, but we're still pushing and pushing. Um, uh, currently, something what's happening in the Netherlands, for instance, is um, we've had the same problem as you pointed out. All the schools are using Maya or 3 ds Max. And so when we want to do something with Blender, it was like, nah, we don't do that. Um, strangely, there were a few young students years ago that um, loved Blender and are now teachers at high school. And uh, what you see happening is that they are starting to push for change within their schools. So we had um, the high school of Amsterdam, uh, who's now, the game development is moving to Blender. And this was somebody who uh, years ago was a um, Blender fan Got, it, got, got to become a teacher at the high school um, and now is pushing for Blender for game development. And it's not the high school, it's the University of Applied Sciences. <laughs> it's the University of Applied Sciences, correct, correct. <laughs> and um, they are now moving to Blender. And you see this movement uh, coming into the Netherlands. So I have the arts school in Rotterdam. They're now also thinking about moving to Blender. So I got an email from them. So it's, it's a bit strange. So now you get schools who were five years ago telling me, no, we're not going to do Blender. Um, now going for the change. And strangely enough, you know, you always meet somebody there who's like, yeah, yeah, I used to use Blender five years ago. So yeah, we're doing this now. So it, it's, it, it's happening. And it, it was the unthinkable. So uh, what are you facing, for instance, um, as a challenge when 
You want to teach Blender? Um, <laughs> um, in France, um, for teaching Blender, there's no really challenge because um, the school where we are teaching are new. And they are not in uh, Autodesk, Maya, Trust, Max, uh, Cycle. So uh, when we come and propose a Blender, you say, well, well okay, okay, don't know, but okay. So uh, it's great, but other school um, is still on 3ds Max, Maya for animation, and it's, it's really hard uh, to to convince to use uh, to switch to Blender. Um, uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have uh, also experience with that? Convincing schools to push for Blender? We, we had another experience because when we created our, our schools uh, many years ago, uh, just we, we were teaching in other schools, but those schools asked us to teach Illustrator, Photoshops, or 3ds yes, for example, but we were uh, using GIMP, Krita, Inkscape, Blender already. So we just say, hey, if you if you don't want to use the, the software we really know, but want us to teach something we don't know, yes, just create our school outside of the cycle and wait and see. And now we can see that uh, many schools use Blender, uh, many schools use other free software programs like Python or anything anything else. And uh, many studios in France uh, begin to use Blender. It's well known. You have uh, more uh, f uh, fonts if you use free software in, in animation movies. So uh, it pushes Blender. Uh, yeah, so I in Spain I've been seeing uh, a switch. I think uh, Blender 2.8, of course, has a lot of weight in that uh, because it has changed the perception that people has about Blender. And what I've seen is that even though most of the schools are still using 3DS or Maya because it's the industry standard, this is starting to change. And I have even been contacted by some schools that they are interested in getting into Blender because they are looking forward to a transition uh, next year or in the next few years, because they are they are tired of licensing problems, of uh, expensive uh, licenses, and well, Blender is very easy in that regard, both for uh, the schools and for the students. There is also uh, something that I've been noticing happening more and more, there is students themselves, before they were like, uh, no, but I have to learn Max if I want to work in the industry. Yeah. And now uh, some have been telling me that they are studying in a school. In the school, they teach them Max or Maya. But when they arrive home, they work with Blender because they like it more. So <laughs> I think in the next few years, we can expect a change in that regard. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I have the same experience. Um, but for me, like, you know, we, we, did, we went to Blender. We moved. We teach animation, and we were Maya. And we moved to Blender, and it lasted for two years or three years. Um, but it was the staff that pushed it ag away from Blender because um, they didn't want to learn a new software. So I think it's the students didn't care. They were very happy with Blender. They were very happy with whatever. But the staff were the ones to convince because they have to spend a lot of months to transition. If you're an expert in Maya, you don't want to yeah. change. You do not want to move. And so they fought it, fought it to the nail. And that was the, the hard thing. The school didn't care. No one else cared. The students didn't care but the staff. And that was the issue we've had. And they fought back really roughly and then we dropped Blender. So it's a real shame, but anyway, yeah, so it's, it's a, you know. That's why I think that the fact that uh, the private uh, software, instead of facilitating the licenses are complicating it, that will change, maybe not the staff, but the ones who make the decisions and put the money, uh, say that, well, we cannot afford this anymore, so you have to learn. <laughs> I think that the old people die out, the young ones come through, the generation. Uh, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> let, let me ask the questions. Can we make a student version of Blender? So it's much easier for a student to learn, right? <laughs> because see, I, I'm not an animator, right? I open the wheelport and all this, I look at all the things, I get confused. And look at 10 years of kids. That's a, a good question. What, 
in your opinion, is a student version? Uh, it's, it's a stripped down of Blender 2.8. So what does a student want to learn? Building model, animation, something very simple that yeah. they, can, they can pick it up very fast. Because just to learn the manuals on the 2.8, I mean, yeah. a lot of kids, they get scared. So why don't we make a, a simple one? This is, this is a topic I, was, I had a few, if you had waited one or two slides, I had it. Because this is a discussion we had last year as well. In Blender, it is possible to create a template. And that's a stripped down version of Blender. And um, the question was, do we need a template to teach Blender at different levels? Do we need to strip it down? So that was kind of what I was asking about, the Blender 101 project, is that what that was? Uh, no, just uh, in okay. general. Teaching so Blender at different levels, I do we need a I seem to remember there was a, there was a Blender 101 initiative. Yeah. Anybody remember yeah. that? Yeah, there was. True. And it was along with the application templates, was it the same sort of thing? I think it was parallel. Okay. The, the uh, Blender 101 project was about these templates, okay. making it possible to uh, create specific templates for different types of workflow. So the question is, do we need one for, especially given Blender 2.8, uh, do we need one for uh, education, as um, is being suggested? So we're, we'll have to wait for some more discussions to see how those are implemented in the future, is, is kind of where we're at? Uh, well, the thing is, l last year, uh, people thought that we might need a template. Um, I want to share a few experiences so far. Because, just to start, who's teaching in Blender 2.8? Great. <laughs> Are you experiencing issues with Blender 2.8? Yeah. Uh, Depends. Um, can we pass the mic? <laughs> Microphone? I think you, were, you wanted to say something. Um, there's a, a problem that um, I know about is that certain schools were having problems with Blender 2.8 on Intel GPU drivers on Windows. So I'm not sure. Yeah, do you, do I think the problem? problem was that some students had a very old uh, uh, laptop uh, that wasn't uh, compatible with OpenGL yeah. 3.3. And also some Mac user that didn't update the system uh, weren't able to use the 2.8. Cool. Any, any more problems? Okay. The person. Actually, I could add one thing because uh, we are trying to educate people who are already professionals and are usu usually uh, the commercial application users, but we also see the trend of many of them switching to Blender, I think mainly for the license reasons and simply for the usability. But for us, uh, we are trying to reach the design-oriented community and most of the users in that community are Mac users and we are uh, Windows users as creators. So I would say here, uh, here we are experiencing some, some problems because the shortcuts on Mac are a bit different and people from that community would like to empower themselves. They, they don't necessarily need to create super advanced stuff in Blender. They yeah. would like to have a, two, a 3D application that simply, simply helps them uh, very quickly pushing some of the designs into the third dimension. So for example, instead of creating sets of drawings, they simply create a very simple 3D geometry, do a very simple render, and then colorize it in Photoshop. And this is the way they would like to present the idea. So yeah, as I said, a lot of people from that spectrum uses Macintosh and to, to somehow uh, connect those two audiences, the people who want to make more professional stuff, let's say advanced renderings using the NVIDIA GPUs, then it creates this kind of problem that it's not available on Mac, they have to use CPU, that increases the render times, and yeah, I would say this is something we are trying to uh, find the optimal solution that would kind of come, like help uh, both groups, the Windows and the Mac users. Okay, um, anybody, any thoughts on that subject? I also heard that Macintosh users will in the future suffer from being remained or being in a lack of support from Apple 
because there is metal things going on and no support for OpenGL and Vulkan, so pr it's probably will die pretty quickly. So Blender has no support at all for any kind of accelerated graphics. Okay. If I could just randomly add a few things. Uh, speaking of popularizing Blender, this year I was approached by the Technical University of Munich if I would like to have a course. It didn't work out in the end for some reasons, but it was very interesting for me to actually get approached by this class of university and they wanted to have some very basic Blender course for the engineering masters, I think where they would just learn some basics, how to present the simple animations of some yeah. technical things. So I, I really think there is a lot of interest in the official educational institutions, in including Blender to, to their, uh, well, system, I could and say that. Do you think, uh, especially with Blender 2.8 um, and the growing interest, um, do you see any challenges there? I Apart would from the, the Mac, Windows issues um, you just described? Do you like see any other issues? This year I was creating my first course in Blender, which took me around nine months. So I started with the early 2.8 beta. And actually throughout the, the entire beta process, uh, progress, I didn't have any problems. Once the official 2.8 was out, the problems started. Yeah. For the users mostly. and But with the test versions of 2.81 right now, m I think all of the issues are solved. So cool. I would say it's just this trans transition period of the yeah. official version that caused some bugs for some people. Because yeah. um, basically I had the same. Um, I just started with uh, Blender 2.8 and we just had um, took a group of students who hadn't done anything with 3D before. And um, we've, we've just watched and trying to observe what was going on. And I've came up with these kind of experiences. I've noticed that Blender 2.8 was much easier than Blender 2.7.9, which for me was a huge, huge surprise because it's a um, quite complex workflow. And um, in 2.7.9, you, you start the cube already with the handles. So um, I was thinking, okay, are, are students gonna have trouble problems with that? that uh, they cannot immediately start. They have to select a tool first before starting. They have to select um, their environment before starting the workflow. And uh, to my surprise, it wasn't. So uh, they could easily find the tools and uh, start working. Uh, when creating the B3D 101 tutorials, uh, we've noticed it was much shorter. So we would have five minutes video tutorials explaining the basics of how to grab, rotate, scale. And now it was really easy. Um, mainly also because all operators are in menus. So um, beforehand, we had to teach kids all these shortcuts, which is crazy. And now we have things in the menus. Um, however, I've noticed that a few Menu items are still a bit not very logical for students. Like, for instance, subdivision is put under an edge, and students are like, techni technically it's correct, but they don't understand why uh, subdivision is um, placed under menu items. Um, a bit of best practices is that we've been using Eevee, and that really helps a lot. <laughs> it really brings down render times. And, um, also, um, switching to rendered mode, um, students forget to s that they have to switch to rendered if they want to see the output, especially the materials, if you're using uh, cycles. Uh, with Eevee, you can disable the use nodes, and then you will see the colors in your, in your viewport. But with cycles, you have to switch to rendered mode. And that was something that all the students were forgetting. And you could tell them 10 times, no, switch to rendered mode. So uh, what we did in the, the second course is we let them already switch to rendered mode and um, continue modeling in that mode because they were all forgetting about it. <laughs> it was a bit strange. 
Um, this the microphone. Well, uh, at least we are all teachers, and I like to um, make some little gaps in my lessons, so they are saying, "Oh, I made a mistake." Because when I make when I make mistakes, they are recognizing more. This is the nature of. So if you are um, leaving out this gap at the beginning, they they haven't got the chance to uh, learn from this mistake. My opinion. Yeah. Um, for the beginner's tutorials, we let them switch in render mode. Um, what I'm seeing now, because I'm constantly uh, experimenting, is that uh, slowly the, uh, they become aware of these mode switches. So now they know. Uh, but I let them start now in rendered mode. Because in the beginning, it was annoying, because they were constantly like, why don't I see my colors? Why don't I see my colors? And you're like, I need to go to rendered. So I let them start in rendered mode, and now they get the ID, also the ID of the workflow uh, there. It becomes clear, because for many young students, it's like, why do I have all these steps uh, upstairs? So um, given these experiences, I'm going to go ahead and get back also to what are your experience and best practices. And again, do we think that if given Blender 2.8, uh, do we need a template for it? Do we need to? strip out uh, a lot of the menu items uh, when teaching Blender. So when I look um, and just a question, um, if I press new and, and uh, select a, um, a workspace, is, is this already a template or? No. no, this is called workspace? It's just a workspace. Okay. A template, uh, you can create a template for a specific workflow. And it's something you can uh, create yourself. That was the than the one-on-one project. So it's it's creating the script that kind of leaves out, I don't know, uh, all the menus and certain tools. Yeah. So you can create a specific template for animation, for instance, where you leave out all the modeling and the compositing yeah. and the video sequence editing stuff. So uh, kids cannot, or yeah. students cannot click on them. What we have experienced was what is al already working very well is uh, workspaces that you can just um, go to the sculpting workspace or to this grease pencil to the animation workspace and you do not have to explain the window types as before as like with uh, 2.7 uh, you just say hey press file new and then open that workspace and, and they can already um, immediately start to work and this is very great um, because you do not have to explain how to get there to, to the tools you want to explain so this is uh, uh, I think for me, it's, um, it seems to be sufficient. I, I, I would not say that I need another simplification of something because I can just uh, make a screenshot of a specific workspace and then go through the buttons with uh, the kids and then they understand how they are made for and, and, and what they can do with them. Yeah. Um, and they cannot animate if they are in a sculpting session. So all the complicated stuff is not visible there. Yeah, okay. So what you're saying, bring back the workspaces? Uh, the workspaces are already uh, available, already there. right? Yeah. yeah. And that uh, basically works, it should be enough. Um, in addition to that, um, last year I thought, oh my God, we're gonna need a template. But I was quite surprised to see how fast students were picking up with no template. And um, the other thing I'm questioning whether a template should work is you want to make the step f for, a s for a student to learn about all the other tools in Blender. You want to make that step easy. Because what I see my students doing is, well, with the tutorials, I le learn how they can grab, rotate, scale, do a bit of color and lightning. So now they are starting to explore for themselves. And um, the whole exploring step is, is it's quite easy because, well, the buttons are there. So they, they start experimenting and creating things. So, and that's why I, I'm not sure if a template would work, if a template would limit students in their creativity. On the other hand, it can make this complex user interface a bit more simple, true. So from my point of work and uh, experience, I don't see that students will need templates at all. 
because Blender should be exposed in the whole entirety for them. But I think that templates could be useful for scientists because this is another story, the whole new subject, different thing. But if you prepare Blender for work with visualizations or for scientific stuff, there is better to hide every possible button because scientists are scientists, yeah? Like me, they just like to press things and mess things up. Uh, about that, for example, with uh, Julio, we did uh, this add-on for uh, medical uh, medical stuff. Yeah. yeah. So they we were focused in doing just one thing. We weren't interested in all the other part of the software. So we isolated all the function that they had to use. So maybe the template in general is uh, useful for people that have a specific need yeah. and they don't have to waste time understanding the whole part of the software. So for example, if you're working with 3D printing, uh, it's better to have the tools that allows you to have a non-manifold uh, geometry at the end. Or uh, uh, for scientists, for example, the, the same thing. Uh, two things, one about the template. Uh, I believe that that would be very confusing because you're teaching your students how to work with Blender, but at the same time they come home, they download Blender, and they see something entirely different from what they are used to already. That is a huge problem. And the second one is sort of connected. Uh, it goes with the complications of teaching Blender in general. Uh, I have four nephews, and I taught them Blender. Uh, the problem I found is that uh, my Blender is very different from vanilla Blender because I have uh, all these plugins that help me do my work that much better and faster. For example, I use Box Cutter and uh, Decal Ops extensively. And uh, the problem there is that I cannot uh, distinguish between Blender and using those plugins. Uh, for me, they are already a part of Blender and I do not see Blender without them. Uh, so that's <laughs> plugins are an entirely different complication. Can I say one thing? Uh, um, I, I think uh, actually there was a lot of discussion about this Blender 101 project. And I think one of the reasons why it didn't go forward as fast as it was expected uh, is that uh, many people thought that it would sort of, uh, um, I don't know the word right now, um, spread, um, like make many different versions of Blender. Uh, that you know, people would look for a tutorial about 3D printing, and the tutorial is using a totally different thing than uh, the actual Blender. So um, I don't know. I I think the in my mind uh, one of the uses of this that could be interesting is for very young kids. That that could help uh, because if a young kid sees a shitload of buttons, they will. Uh, get afraid, but uh, for most people, I, I would suggest using the actual blender. In fact, uh, that was I was I wanted to say. So it depends of the the people you want to teach or what you want to teach. For example, we teach to uh, postgraduate students or professionals. So they just want to learn Blender, and that's all. No, not the minus Blender, you know. Uh, but of course, if you have uh, 10 years, uh, children, maybe Blender would be too much for them. Um, and maybe it would be nice to have something simpler just to get on the most important uh, functionalities. So it, it seems easy to them, yeah. Um, in my experience, uh, teaching like uh, 12 years old and f 25 years old, for me, it's always a puzzle I have to solve by myself before uh, because I grew up with Blender, so for me, it's a puzzle naturally solved. Uh, the puzzle I try to solve every time I prepare a class for beginners is um, are the principles uh, behind the user interface uh, correct in my mind? Can I explain them, uh, put them in a explanation that people can visualize, visualize before looking at the program. So for me, the most important thing is first uh, things first. So basic the theory on the principles. And when they 
look at the buttons, they're gonna identify much, much easier. Second step for me uh, when I'm solving this puzzle is uh, training. They were gonna go through L, uh, going through every step like buttons all the time during all day. They're gonna experience by themselves uh, based on the theory we, we spoke before. So they, they're gonna have lots of time to explore, explore by themselves. So my strategy to solve this problem is very good theory basics on what is uh, 3D modeling, for instance, uh, and then um, make them discover by themselves. Okay, so. Well, one final word on the templates. I can safely say I don't need one. I just use the, the default stuff with a few alterations to make it easier. And I just teach G, S, and R, and I teach the it's too late, anyway. Thank you. So I would like to say a little bit different thing because we are talking before about this funding, about courses, summer schools and blender days. So I thought that it would be nice to reunite in some way and just organize ourselves in a way that allow us to exchange between countries. Maybe I would like to invite Tobias, for example, and for exchange I could go to your summer school to deliver some lectures, things like that. And universities and schools are more prone to international collaboration in if they are listening to this, oh, this is really international, well, no, that's the big thing. Maybe that will be easier for us to collaborate and also spread blended teaching. Again, yeah. so you all my last, are invited. Uh, my uh, last topic, we used to have the mailing list. Yeah. And um, we found out that, well, a lot of educators were not using the mailing list. I know in the beginning it was used a lot and um, it kind of died. So uh, if we're talking about collaboration, do we need to create an education channel yes, on the chat? Yes. But creating a channel, and I'm talking out of experience a bit, creating a channel means also involvement. Means if people have questions, um, we need to answer. And it's not just one person um, answering everything. So if we decide, because we can have a Blender channel, education channel like that. And I think it would be good for Blender to have an education channel because there are a lot of cool things going on and to make visible that we are talking about professional education for Blender. Uh, to have a channel where people can come, ask questions. I know we, need, we ha used to have a Slack group uh, which was actively used just to ask peer questions like, okay, I'm running into this. Uh, what are you, your experience on that, uh, or how do you approach uh, a problem like that? Um, so if there is interest, uh, we can create a Blender chat, or on Blender chat, uh, an education channel, uh, but it also involves you as educators um, to make something out of it. Cool. I think I have to wrap up. Sorry, I had a lot of things. I know the Blender Certified Training was also a topic to discuss, but uh, we're here, uh, we're still at the Blender Conference, so um, let's discuss at the bar. And I hope you got a bit of your answers. Yeah, you Thank you. Yeah, you think I can